You're listening to episode 646 of the Father Bills Podcast. Welcome back. This week's episode is entitled, Love That Your Joy Might Be Complete, given on the sixth Sunday in Easter, 2018. Do you remember your first love? How did it start? What caught your eye? Did you show your affection to them first? Did you reveal your feelings to them first? That was pretty gutsy if you did. A lot of us guys are in that boat. It's expected of us. It's not often that the the woman gets on her knee and pulls out the, the ring, right? How did it feel when someone had affection for you before you had affection for them? And you found out about it. Like, surprise, that person over there really likes you. Were you excited? Surprised? Honored? Humbled? Maybe a little embarrassed? Were you afraid? Did you run for the hills? Honestly, these are some of the experiences that we live for. It's the spice of life. And it says something, it it speaks something. There's a meaning behind it all. And it is that we are seeking joy and fulfillment. And we find it in love. So how about this? How did it feel when your affection was rejected? When your gift was repelled back or stomped on, ridiculed? How did you feel when everything that you said was taken in a different context out of distrust and disgust? How did it feel when you made a real sacrifice and it went unnoticed? I mean, completely. There's certainly no joy and fulfillment in that. But this, these are our experiences as human beings in this world. And yet we are made for communion with others. And that's why it hurts so much when it's rejected. We hear in the scriptures today that God loves us. My question to myself and to you is, what's our reaction to that? Because it's clear, it's not that we loved him, he loved us first. God's love, though, isn't fickle like our affections are. His love does not depend on what we have done or not done. His love is not subject to change either. It is constant, even when we don't love him back. Even when we express our anger or even hatred at him back. He loves us. God loves us in a way that is quite often just hard to take. I'm not worthy is the response to that. It's kind of like the guy who sees a girl and says to himself, man, she is way out of my league. God's like that. He is totally out of our league. The Father is completely other, separate, magnificent, and holy. His love is not, though, about mere affection. It is a purposeful decision. His love is so great and perfect that he did more than just sacrifice himself for us. Think about it. Often when there is a threat to our own being or our loved ones, we might put ourselves in harm's way. I'm going to protect my family. It's another way that's put. But would we put our spouse in harm's way to protect the family? 
Would we put one of our children in the way to protect our family? See, there's a whole other level of love. It's okay if I do it, but I'm not going to let them do that. But in effect, this is what the father did. He gave away the one person he loved the most. He gave away his only begotten son to become like us, to be part of a family, to have close friends, to work, to struggle, to trust, to love, to suffer, and ultimately get betrayed, tortured, and die. He came to save his family, and he put his son at risk to do so. Many saints have been martyred as they've offered themselves as an exchange for another, and that is certainly heroic and worthy of sainthood. But in a sense, shrouded in the mystery of the Trinity, the person of the Father sent the person of his Son so that he could take all that has been thrown upon humanity, all our sin, upon himself. And he suffered, died, and rose from the dead, and then ascended into heaven. His son did all these things willingly, obediently, and lovingly. He did all these things so that when our time comes, we would know how to follow. God the Son, instead of being detached from our plight, got right in with us immediately, intimately. So you see, our Father knows the path of joy. And it's not what we often think about it is. It's not the path of affection. It's a type of love that is beyond that. And it is stamped into our very beings, and we know it when we experience it. And yet we make a mess of it, pretty much. So Jesus came to remind us, to show us how to live, how to love. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He says it so about himself. <clears throat> he came to remind us of an intimacy that we have long forgotten or that is stamped in us that we so yearn for. One that turns our relationships from slaves to friends, from fear to trust. Jesus gave us commandment, which is the key to joy and fulfillment in this life. That commandment is to love one another as I love you, he says. Notice the commandment is in the present tense. I love you. Not, I have loved you, or I loved you. We say that. His love is eternal. And he speaks eternally. I love you. That means he's still loving us. His love is not stuck in the past, it is here now. It's living in our midst and it's not based on affection. It's not based on merit. It's based on him and his divine love. So while we may find amazing happiness and fulfillment with our spouses, ultimately our joy will only be complete when we obey the commandment of, of our Lord and love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind and lay down, our friend, lay down our lives for others, like he did. Our culture needs this message repeatedly spoken to it. We have a culture that is about itself. Often, or I should say rarely, is there news about someone sacrificing themselves for another. Rather, it's all about crime and ill repute and other things like that. But it is good for us to find companionship, deep, intimate, spousal love. But it cannot completely fill itself or fill ourselves in that much. When I do pre-marriage preparation, it's like a brain buster or a, a popping a balloon. I say, just be mindful, this person will not fulfill you. Imagine when you were first in love, that's often a thought we have. This person will complete me. I think Tom Cruise said something silly like that in a movie once. Just ask a couple that's been married more than a year, and they'll tell you it's not easy. 
And unfortunately, couples too often fail to bring God into their relationship, which truly cripples them. I've heard the statements, keep God out of the bedroom. Think about it. What sense is there in keeping the author of love out of your love life? It makes no sense. Unless it's only purely human love and one without God. It's like a tricycle with a broken wheel. You're going to struggle to get anywhere. Love himself wants to be present in your marriage in all forms that it takes on. It is the only way as married couples to truly find fulfillment. When two people come to a church to get married, as Christians, it is binding of three people, husband and wife in Christ. That's why we call it a sacrament. He is living in the marriage. And Jesus wants this. He wants us to live with joy and in joy. And he knows that it must be done with him because he is love himself. He told us to obey his commandments so that his joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Who does not want complete joy? Joy is only complete though when it has been infused with eternity, infused with divine love. Love. God, who is love. So if you've not put God in your spousal life, if you don't pray together, if you don't praise God and invite him into your most intimate moments, then your love is half-baked, partial, merely human, and flawed. As a priest, imagine if I just said, I'm going to be celibate because I can do it. Or not do it, whatever you want to think about it. You know. No priest can be a priest without a love relationship with Christ as well. And our love of you will also be flawed, half-baked, partial. It'll be seeking affections. And no leader can be leading when it's based on the affections of a mass crowd or a particular few people. The church is not a democracy, I guess is what we're saying. Jesus didn't say, hey, let's vote about what we believe. And it puts all these things, it puts in our relationships this affection model as the only thing that drives it. And so when things are bad, it easily breaks. Now, as a single person, if you do not pray at all, you do not talk to God in your everyday life and all the things that you do, like doing dishes, washing clothes, driving to work, shopping, etc., then complete joy will always escape you as well. See, some people have thought that I must be married in order to be fulfilled. That if I'm single, there must be something wrong with me. And that is false. Now I'd say if we do not have Christ in our life, that is where there is no true happiness. People ask me, well, how can you do this? That's the common question. How do you do it, Father Bill? I mean, golly, you don't have a wife. And all I can tell you is only because of Jesus Christ. He's the beginning, the middle, and the end. When things are going well, I give him praise. When things are not going well, I beg for his help. And when we priests stop praying, and when we stop believing, and when we stop doing those things that are essential to finding joy in our lives as a priest, well, that's what you call a very unhappy priest on his way to doom. So I have some homework for couples and for singles. So couples. I would like to ask you to do this if you're not doing it already. And of course, figure it out in your own milieu, but sit down together each day or at each night and commit to praying together, not grace before meals. That's easy. All you have to do is say that one prayer we all have memorized. Now I'm asking you to give up your heart. Sit together, knee to knee, hand in hand, praying for each other thanking God for each other. Not arguing like, oh dear Lord, you know how wrong she was about that thing, change her. <laughs> you know, lightning can go through buildings, so be careful. 
But I, you know, honestly, do this daily. Your arguments will take on a different character. They won't be so personal. There is somebody else entered in the room that because of your prayer, because the two of you have gathered, Christ is in your midst. And he will make light that which is heavy. He will reorient your narcissism about your need, and you'll find that it isn't so needy after all. So bring God who is love into your prayer, into your love for each other, yes, and even into your bedroom. Love each other and give praise to God who made you like puzzle pieces to be compliments to each other. And then you can contemplate in your flesh the ecstasy of heaven. Now, single people, homework. Spend time in prayer every day as well. Tell God your thoughts, your wishes, your fears, and even your angers. Do not sugarcoat your words. Oh, Heavenly Father, how art thou in your divine holiness? No, that's not how you talk normally. Use your words. Don't sugarcoat them. Tell them exactly where you are. He knows what you mean. And then stop. You know, sometimes as humans, we need to, and I know I do this, I'll say something multiple times to make sure you get it. He gets it the first time. And in fact, he probably got it before you even said anything. But then stop. Say no more. And listen. Trust me that God has more to say about you than you have to say about you. His wisdom is greater than your wisdom. His love is greater than any self-love you might have. Steep yourself like a tea bag in the tea pot of the Lord's love. Be present to God then, who speaks in a small, still voice. Hear him tell you that you are deeply and perfectly loved. Listen to his voice in your innermost self, how you are his precious child and that he's given his life for you. He spent his life in service and wants you to do the same by loving others and laying your life down for those around you. Be they your co-workers, your family, friends, or even your enemy. And this is true whether you are single young or single old, or single in between. Christ has revealed these things through his life, which has been recorded in scripture. Love one another as I love you, he said. Why? So that his joy may be in you. A joy beyond all understanding. A joy that is not dependent on a situation or affection. And then, your joy may be complete. Thank you again for listening to this episode of the Father Bill's Podcast. I invite you to go to my webpage, fatherbill.org, F-R-B-I-L-L.org, and there you can pick up all the other podcasts if you've missed any, uh, all the way back to 2005, I think. All the way back then, yeah. And also on my Facebook page and Twitter account and Instagram, things like that. And you can just email me as well from that website. So uh, that's what it is, fatherbill.org, F-R-B-I-L-L.org, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And in the meantime, may God bless you and have a great week. Bye-bye.